All right, welcome everybody for this third lecture on neutrinos. I'm sure the attendance will still rise in the first few minutes, but these are the canonical three minutes waiting we have before starting. So, um, Stefan, ready for your third lecture. It's all yours. Yeah, thank you. Um, let me just this. Uh, this is confusing. One second here. Delete this. Um, just a second. I have several instances of the same talk on my. Start with the wrong one. Um, yeah. So uh, you can see the slides. Is that okay? Full screen. Yep. Yep. All yep. is fine. Full screen. Oh. Sounds good. Sounds good. Go. Great. So that's where we ended yesterday. Uh, and thanks for coming again today on the on the last of these uh, uh, three uh, lectures, um, where I showed you the uh, delta CP phase uh, in a two dimensional representation with the uh, uh, mixing angle sine square uh, theta two three. That's a particular interesting one i haven't talked about it in much detail because it is uh, 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 near to to maximal and the question is is really how how maximal the mixing is that's one of the questions which which these experiments uh, uh, try to address but we focus more on, on on cp violation here and you see that the two current experiments nova and t2k one at fermilab and the other one uh, at um, uh, in Japan uh, are well not not directly in agreement here and uh, the statistical uh, significance of what's being seen is is still uh, not that great so we need really the next generation experiments now this provides it's me an opportunity to also talk a little bit about my uh, you know the project I'm, I'm currently uh, working on, as, as Albert has already said at the beginning, which is Dune. So this is a little bit of an advert. It's like when you watch a YouTube video, you also have to watch the, watch the adverts that come uh, with it for this, uh, for this project. Um, so we had this slide or a similar slide before, and it's just again to remind you because there are two really two uh, uh, large projects going forward in, in long baseline neutrino physics how you pick this and uh, what you want to do you want to put yourself on the maximum of the oscillations which is just uh, driven by this frequency shown in the box up here and uh, uh, that is depending on the baseline uh, uh, which is, you know, 300 kilometers for, uh, for, for Japan and you know, in America, as you'll come uh, see in a moment, it's, it's at the order of 1300 kilometers. So you, if, you, if you put that L here in there and the known uh, uh, mass difference squared, then you get these, these typical energies and you want to have a, a narrow band or energy uh, beam for for this length and a, a broadband uh, beam, which covers both the first and the second maximum in this case. You'll have no matter effects here, but you'll have matter effects here, or very few matter effects here. And uh, this also governs the choice of technology. So for, for an experiment like Hyper-K in, in Japan, the the energy reconstruction, it is important, but it's also, uh, it's more of a counting experiment and therefore it is really crucial to get as much mass as possible. That's something you can do with water because water is cheap and abundant. Um, if, you, if you want to do the broadband beam uh, uh, model, which I just described, and uh, you, know, you depend more on the reconstruction of the energy to, uh, disentangle the different oscillation effects. And this is better done in, a, in an experiment like in a technology like liquid argon, which I'll talk about uh, today. Uh, now, of course, liquid argon is, is, it's actually not that expensive, but it's not like water. 
costs like a, a dollar a, a, a litre or something like that. Uh, but these detectors, because of the technology, and, and you have to cool everything, uh, is more complicated. So uh, they are usually, uh, you know, on a smaller scale. Still, pretty big scale, as we'll see. So these are the two big next generation neutrino experiments. I've also added IceCube. Of course, IceCube gets its uh, medium where, uh, for free, which is uh, why it is in terms of size actually the largest experiments because it uh, it measures neutrinos in 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 the ice it puts these optical detectors uh, into the uh, ice of the south pole which uh, serves as a medium and of course uh, is that's an excellent and great idea i'll not talk about it here however because it's focusing on neutrinos at accelerators um so this is the first of the two projects, and uh, this is Hypercamiocande. This is the uh, extension of what we already saw before uh, the T2K experiment. Uh, it uh, is in the same look. It's almost in the same location. So uh, from J Park to uh, uh, you know to the, the other side of Japan, uh, with about three hundred kilometers baseline. It is, by the way, not. Uh, exactly in the same location. So where Hyper-K is going to be built is going to be uh, again under a mountain uh, right next to it, uh, not exactly, but you know, it's like a kilometer or so away or something like that. Uh, it's not exactly in the same position. It's not in the same uh, cavern as, as Super-K. Uh, just to give you a, a, a scale, so the, the overburden in this case, it's, it's uh, uh, about 650 meters, and it's got four times the number of photomultipliers surrounding the water detector, which then uh, give you the opportunity to reconstruct the Cherenko rings. Uh, they also have improved uh, the the quality of the, the, the photo uh, multipliers. And uh, in terms of uh, total and fiducial volume, so total volume is the total water in there. And then uh, if, you, if you really you know, look at what you can do the measurement, you usually reduce that. It's true for all these detectors to a fiducial volume. But just to see the scale, it's about a factor of five compared to the, to the super K uh, detector, which we are which we have talked about before. The principle for the far detector is the same as for super K. You reconstruct uh, the Cherenkov rings from muons and electrons produced in those neutrinos. And you see uh, the kind of answers also Albert's question from, from last time. It gives you, you know, the scale of these rings. It's really microscopic uh, uh, in, in, uh, as you see from this unfolded uh, surface of the of the detector. It's a big international project. Uh, it's about four hundred people with uh, you know collaborators from from the U.S. and Asia and and Europe uh, mainly. Now there'll be a as I said a totally new far detector. Uh, the the near detector at, at J Park is also going to be upgraded in, in a crucial way. And uh, I've shown this here. So the first there is the so-called ND280 uh, detector, which already exists now. There'll be uh, upgrades to that, but no fundamental change. Whereas what is interesting is the plan to add an additional one kiloton Cherenkov water detector with a baseline of one kilometer, uh, which will allow for vertical movement. So why is this? Well, as we have seen before, it's actually quite advantageous to be able to measure at the near detector where you normalize your, your flux uh, uh, for the oscillation measurement with the same uh, material uh, and target material as in the far detector. There's always been different for T2K uh, compared to like say NOVA where this uh, near detector and far detector technology was quite different. Um, for T2K. And now there is this idea to add a water to Renkov, which is, of course, uh, helping to reduce systematics. Um, it's, it's also good that, uh, you know, you put it at different, slightly different uh, uh, baseline, also helps. Now, the other thing is that 
it will move vertically up and down. And this is actually something which is a very interesting concept, which also Dune will uh, 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 employ. And I'll therefore describe it a little later uh, when we talk about the Dune detector. But the basic idea behind this is that you probe the um, neutrino energy spectrum at different angles. Uh, we know already from what we talked about last time that the energy spectrum as a function of angle changes. Something which is more hypothetical, you could extend the baseline of hyper K. Uh, and if you take the beam from J park here to the right, and it goes to hyper K, it just extends here uh, uh, into, you know, uh, uh, across the ocean to, uh, to Korea. And there have been discussions about putting a similar detector as hyper K, a large water Cherenkov detector into uh, a mine in, uh, in South Korea. But this is still quite hypothetical. Now that would extend the baseline to something more similar to what experiments like Dune have. So this is the other big project, the project uh, both Albert and I are working on, which is uh, the deep underground neutrino experiment at uh, Fermilab. Again, the basic concept here is, as always with these long baseline neutrino experiments, you have a, 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 an accelerator here at uh, Fermilab that produces the beam uh, that goes through a near detector and then goes to South Dakota. Uh, I'll have a little movie for this in a second. Uh, the, the physics idea is that you start as always with a muon neutrino beam, which slowly oscillates. And at the location here, uh, you will be um, dominated by new tau. But as I said before, those are difficult to see uh, uh, because of the energy. Uh, uh, and then a little bit uh, of new E and uh, in there. So uh, this is the formation of Dune that was in 2015, but that was not the original uh, formation of this idea. Dune is a merger of two large projects which existed before LBNE and LBNO, a European and a US dominated collaboration, uh, which both were choosing the liquid argon technology. So uh, at this point, uh, these two projects were merged to become uh, Dune, which is now an international global collaboration uh, with, with more than a thousand collaborators from 33 countries, which includes a CERN. Now that is a scale for neutrino experiment, which is st still quite unusual and it matches the scales of uh, experiments in, uh, at the LHC. And that's also why the collaboration and the experiment is organized more akin to the, what, what an LHC experiment looks like as a, as a global international uh, collaboration. Now this is where uh, the beam goes. Uh, just to give you uh, uh, an idea of the map, uh, we, uh, we are, we are, well, we are not, we are in Zoom, but you know, we're at Chicago at Fermilab and uh, uh, you go all the way west to Leeds, South Dakota, which is uh, about a 14 hour drive. You do it by car. Uh, there's a little movie here, which I sh show you, which just shows the, um, um, uh, how, it, how it operates. So we start out here at Fermilab, west of Chicago. Um, the uh, first step is a beam, which uh, doesn't exist yet, but people are working on it. Uh, it's part of the so-called uh, proton improvement plan. So you produce a high intensity uh, uh, proton source, the protons are then being accelerated into the main injector at Fermilab and uh, then extracted, uh, they uh, hit a target and are bent down uh, into the ground. There's, there's this bending up and down that's actually <laughs> advantageous from the civil construction point of view. Uh, you have a near detector which measures the neutrinos at uh, on site. They go through the earth uh, to South Dakota uh, into this mine uh, where now, fortuitously, just in that moment, we get a supernova. We'll have a little bit on supernovas later. There will be four large modules of liquid argon, just to give you the scale, uh, is here with a human 
and interactions will happen in, in, in these, these other neutrinos. One question often people ask is, you know, how focused is the neutrino beam at that location? Well, it's not focused at all. Of course, it's very, uh, very uh, wide at that point. Uh, so how you put your detectors there doesn't really matter anymore because it is a wide flux. Uh, and then the data goes uh, across the globe. Now, um, uh, what I said, just flashing the slide, a big part of this project is to, uh, in, you know, get a high intensity proton beam uh, at Fermilab. This is also an international project, an accelerator project, uh, uh, state of the art technology, and the plan to have an initial beam of 1.2 megawatts. So the, the power of these beams is, you know, is, is uh, expressed like this. Uh, uh, at, in an energy range 60 to 100 inch by 20 GeV for the protons, and then eventually upgradable by a factor of two, which is really important because if you want to build a good neutrino experiment, it's got to be large because you need to have a lot of mass to get enough neutrino interaction, but you also need a lot of neutrinos. So you need an intense, uh, the most powerful neutrino source possible. The beam goes then to uh, uh, South Dakota. This is uh, uh, the Sand, uh, Sanford Underground Research Facility. It's called Sanford because there's a rich man in, in, in South Dakota who paid a lot of money to keep the mine usable for science. And I think like $70 million, if I remember correctly. So he got his name on the, uh, on the lab's name, which is, I think, uh, totally OK, given the amount of money he, he donated for that. It's a former gold mine. This has been an operation for 150 years or so. It's actually a, a, a very interesting uh, story. Uh, also historically, this is a, a place where gold was found in the late 19th century. Um, the Native Americans uh, living there were uh, you know, displaced uh, basically due to the, this gold rush and um, the, if you've ever heard of uh, the Battle of Little Bighorn and Custer's Last Stand, and so this is all very close to uh, this, this mine. So it has kind of a problematic history, let me put it this way, but uh, you know, it's, um, it's a gold mine which has been operating for a long time, but it's been closed in, in 1992 because the extraction of gold wasn't uh, worth it anymore. Um, when they a lot of the technology in that mine to use it as a lab is, is of course great in a way because you think there's already something there, but a lot of the technology in that mine had to be upgraded. This, uh, the photos, uh, when, when I was there, uh, I took some of these photos uh, then of the, of the system, which, which uh, brings you down uh, the hoist uh, uh, to the, you know, level where Dune will be about a, like a one mile down. And uh, it, it has this kind of uh, a bit old fashioned feeling. That's a dial here. It looks to me like a TARDIS. If you don't know what a TARDIS is, I'm sorry. This is just a, it's a British reference. Um, so there are two shafts going down. There's the Ross shaft and the Yates shaft. We are next to the Ross shaft. And this is not the first time physics experimentation is done there. Uh, this was also the location of the original Davis solar neutrino experiment, which I talked about on the first day. And there are other experiments there like Lux and Majorana experiments that look for dark matter or neutrino that's double beta decay. The excavation for Dune is going to be a new excavation. And this just shows you how these tunnels uh, looks like. And this is on the surface. Um, and I, this is an interesting shot because when people mined there in the late 19th century, they just dug a hole. And this hole is just unbelievable. I mean, it's just you know, 700 meters across and deep. And people just mined the gold until they ran out of gold in there. And then the, because this, uh, this uh, range of gold's going down, uh, uh, then they started building a proper mine. You see here is, 
So the the uh, the dune excavation is the, the the rocks come from over the here on this on this little train here, and then they are thrown into this big hole. And I just couldn't resist showing you that little movie, which is uh, was made just a few weeks ago, and that just shows you how the rock goes uh, uh, down into that hole. Once the whole excavation for dune has been made, it will be like one percent. It will just fill one percent of this gigantic hole with the rock. Um, anyway, this movie just shows you that this is not only diagrams, it's actually uh, stuff that's happening and excavation are happening. So in itself, how will Dune look like? So it's going to be four cryostats because you use liquid argon as a medium. And these cryostats will be in metal structures, which is shown in green and inside is a membrane cryostat. How this looks like is shown here. This is a technology which is well known from uh, transporting liquefied natural gas on the oceans uh, uh, in, in, in big tanks and there are companies that built this. And uh, the technology for this is actually, uh, you know, access through CERN. CERN has a lot of experience in, in dealing with the company GTT that uh, does uh, build these. Just to give you a scale, one of those cryostats is about 20 times 20 meters times 66 meters. That's very big. Uh, I don't know, I, I haven't measured it, but it's, it's definitely as big as the CERN main building uh, where the cafeteria is, you know, if you would fill that all with liquid argon, there'll be four of them. There'll be three caverns. Each of the uh, main cavern, left and right, will uh, uh, house four of the uh, two of these cryostats, and the middle is a is a, a uh, for, for support services. The neutrinos come from here, and we are about one and a half kilometers uh, under the um, under the surface. How do we do the measurement? Well, the measurement is done in, in the way we know, you know, we want to see is a muon neutrino or an electron neutrino. And the uh, only way to do this is to see is a muon coming out, then we know it's a muon neutrino, is an electron coming out of the interactions, an electron neutrino. So we have to distinguish, discriminate between these two. We do this with this liquid argon time projection chamber technology. Now, how does that work? So a neutrino interacts in the liquid argon, which is shown here as a, as a rectangular volume. And what you do, you apply a high voltage, uh, hundreds of kilovolts on, on this. And um, uh, on one side, uh, at least in this version of the technology, you have a cathode and on the other side, you have several planes of anode wires. Uh, the typical drift time, uh, length here is, is quite long. It's, it's, for example, for this three and a half meters, so it's several meters. And for some of the implementations we are planning, it's going to be six meters. The neutrino produces a, a particle, let's say a muon or an electron, which is ionizing. The ionizing particle uh, ionizes the liquid argon. Uh, this, uh, uh, the electrons will drift to the, uh, to, the, to the wires here, and a signal will be um, recorded. So the first two planes will get an induced signal, and then the third plane will collect the signal, so they are called induction and collection planes. You have the wires, and just, you know, they are about five millimeters apart, and thousands and thousands of these, and you have them at different angles so you can reconstruct the picture, the image in, in three dimensions. How powerful this technology is, and I mean, just what I find fascinating, you drift, so there's this track and then you drift it over, let's say two meters or three meters, and you actually reconstruct the track at millimeter precision. Uh, uh, so this this is just a, an amazing technology, and how amazing it is! I, I like this picture uh, is is shown for the microboon experiment. That's one of the short baseline experiments we talked a little bit about here last time, which operates at Fermilab and measures, for example, cross sections, but also looks for sterile neutrinos. This is a real event. It's a stopping muon 
uh, you see the uh, well, the liquid argon is shown in blue. Of course, it's not blue. It looks like water. It's just a transparent liquid, which is actually important. Uh, the the in that event display, um, the, the the level of ionization is shown by color. The most highly ionizing region is shown in red. What you see here is uh, the muon uh, stopping. You see the famous Bragg peak, where the uh, most of the energy is um, uh, stored, and then you uh, deposit it, and then you have a Michel electron and some photons, which you see as little uh, energy deposits here. This technology uh, provides excellent reconstruction of, of uh, charged leptons, but also uh, separation of electrons and photons, something I don't have the time to talk about in more detail. It also is ex extreme, not only good for measuring charge, it also allows us to measure scintillation light because uh, uh, xenon, uh, sorry, argon is, is very um, well suited to that. Um, and all these detectors have complicated light detection systems, which not only measure the the, the T zero, so when the charge was deposited, uh, because it actually takes quite a long time to drift, milliseconds. So the, the light system gives you a, an instant timing signal, but it also helps you to reconstruct energy. This is another microboon event where actually a neutrino interaction happened. You see the neutrino coming from the left, but you don't see it, uh, but then it interacts and produces charged particles. Microboon is on the surface, so you see some of these straight tracks going through, which are just cosmic backgrounds, and there's a pi zero going into two photons. Back to Dune, so the technology for the first module will look exactly like what I just showed you in that little uh, movie. Uh, the scale, again, is, uh, is enormous. Uh, it's shown here. You have uh, alternating planes of anodes and cathodes, uh, which uh, are used to apply the high voltage and then uh, uh, the, the wires are used to read out. And this is one of those wire planes, uh, one module six times two and a half meters, uh, which, which is put actually into the cryostat. Most of these are actually built here very close to where I'm sitting in the UK in, in the Osbury lab, uh, uh, close to Manchester. The other technology for the second module, there's no reason why we should choose the same one, is called vertical drift. So here the drift doesn't happen in the horizontal direction, it happens in the vertical direction. This is still more in the R&D phase, work is happening also at CERN. You have the cathode in the center, you have the anodes and top and bottom. And instead of wires, you put perforated anodes here, which has uh, some advantages because they are easier to produce than the wire planes. Uh, uh, and uh, it will have a similar performance in terms of efficiency and charge readout and, and so on. A lot of the prototyping happens at CERN. This is the CERN courier from a couple of years ago when we started to have a small, but you know, not that small, six by six by six meter large uh, uh, prototype, which is like a 20th of the final Dune module. Uh, and there are actually two of them in the North area. And when you can, at least I don't think with COVID that's quite possible, but if you are at CERN, you can actually uh, look at that. These are the two cryostats for which are now used. This was used for the horizontal, uh, uh, it, is it this way around? Um, I think the, the entrance is here. So I think this is the, the horizontal drift one. And then this is for vertical drift. Um, that's inside. Uh, uh, of course, the light is, the, the, it's, it's gold because it's not as gold. It's, it's, it's actually, uh, if you just look at it, it's uh, steel, so it's really uh, just silvery, but it's like uh, the, the light, which makes it look like that. And they're just beautiful pictures. And this is, so the, this is the cryostat and it's uh, the corrugated uh, 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 metal on the side is just so that it can expand. Um, this is with some of these wire planes in there. They are made of wires of copper beryllium. That's why they have that color. And you see in the back the, the high voltage. Um, this is the vertical drift detector and uh, uh, protodune at, 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 at the north area. 
So these detectors, the, the, the horizontal drift operated first, worked brilliantly, and we are on the surface. So while there was also beam, uh, hadron beam, not neutrino beam, you see a lot of cosmics. Um, the thing that's a little bit of misleading about this, because everything looks straight and you would say, yeah, sure, that's cosmics that go through the detector straight. It's actually not that trivial to reconstruct, especially on the surface, uh, these straight tracks, because what happens is uh, an effect due to the large number of cosmics going through, they, uh, we have actually localized space charge effects because uh, the, the charge just, just dis dis doesn't disappear quickly enough. That's a macroscopic correction you have to apply as a distortion to the electric field. And it can be you know, the order, whatever, 20, 30 centimeters at every given look at a given location. Just the, 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 um, the change in due to this, this space charge effect. Not such a problem if you go one mile on the ground because you don't have those cosmics going through all the time. Now, this just shows you that's a paper uh, uh, Dune wrote on, 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 on this performance and this first detector. You see a lot of cosmics going through, but also something from the Hadron beam here. You just have to get rid of the, the, the cosmics, which is possible. And here, this is a beautiful measurement of the Michel electron, which is the one which is emitted in a muon decay. And you see this is for lower energies, of course, because it's from this process, but you see the beautiful reconstruction. Um, so, yeah, so we got all the bits together almost. We have the beam. I talked about the beam. We have the far detector. What I haven't talked about is the near detector, which is crucial to measure the flux close to the source and also for systematic studies. The way this is done, uh, is that that's based at Fermilab, uh, uh, about 550 meters, 575 meters uh, from the beam source, and it has three components and Y3, I'll explain in a moment. The beam is coming from the, the right here, and the first is a liquid argon detector. It uses pixel technology, currently prototyped at University of Bern in Switzerland. Um, pixels are like a bit different from the wires and, and the perforated anodes, which I showed you. They are actually uh, really uh, little pixels, which, which have a, one advantage. They provide true three-dimensional reconstruction. That's really nice because here at the near detector, actually the neutrino rate is very, very high. And having a, a pixelated detector helps you to, to deal with you know, occupancy problems. Then you have a gas argon detector in a magnetic field. Uh, that's a TPC again. And the gas bit, and I don't have the time to talk about it in detail, but the gas bit is nice because you can actually look at the structure of the interaction. You know, nothing is being absorbed in the liquid. Uh, you can literally blow up that region around the neutrino argon interactions and extremely well measure uh, uh, the, the, you know, the properties of the interaction. And then there's a beam monitor, which is a, a detector of its own. Uh, it's, it's actually the, going to be the Chloe magnet from Frascati, which will be brought over and filled with a new de tracking detector uh, uh, here. So this, this uh, detector will have a new life, this magnet, uh, after serving uh, uh, Frascati in, in the experiment there. One trick, and I mentioned this before, and one crucial thing is, is actually to go, to have the ability to move the near detector. If you remember, I showed you the, the, the Cherenkov detector that uh, Hyper-K has, they move it vertically, they want to move it vertically. Now, whether you move it vertically, up and down, or so, uh, sideways, or horizontal, of course, does make no difference for the, for the energy spectrum. The neutrinos don't know about that. But as we have calculated last time, the energy distribution depends on how off-center you are from the from the center of the beam. So the lowest energy 
uh, is here when you are like, and this is translated from an angle into a distance. If we move at our location of 575 meters, a detector 33 meters to the side, we get this spectrum. If we are on the axis, we get this spectrum. And if we can move it anywhere in between, we can uh, um, you know, get reproduce any of these. Why is that important? So you see how we would do it. We keep that part of the detector sand on axis and we move the other ones, which is quite a, an engineering effort. So you better be sure you need that. But it is important because what you can do, you can, what we want to do at the end is to predict the oscillated flux at the far detector. We have to know that. And what we can do with this by overlaying the different spectrums, spectra here, and provide, uh, making a linear superposition of them, we can predict any spectrum and construct any spectrum we want, including the oscillated spectrum and the far detector. Another way of thinking about it is we just have multiple test beam experiments with different, uh, with different uh, uh, controlled energies. And that's really important to control the systematics. So let me just say, how is it going to look at the end? So this is uh, what we would get after seven years. This is the muon and anti-muon uh, 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 anti -muon neutrino uh, spectrum. We would expect to run half-half, but that's not uh, cast in stone, depending on how the parameter space looks like. You could run only with, new, uh, with one horn current. That's, of course, not a Dune event. It's a micro Dune event, but it just shows you how a charged current neutrino, uh, 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 muon neutrino event would look like, very pure, very serving. And uh, this is uh, the signal we would see, the, uh, 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 the oscillated signal at the far side. And this is for muons, and this is, uh, this, uh, this is for uh, electrons. Look a little closer, you will see that as we saw that for the other experiments before, the muon neutrino, uh, 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 the muon sample is thousands of events. This is hundreds of events. That's a lot of statistics, but the electron neutrino appearance signal is always smaller. So once we have measured this, how do we extract the information? And I've shown that equation equation before this is actually the probability for a new mu to go to new e and depends on all these parameters. On the plot, you see the energy distribution. The black one is the unoscillated one, at, uh, which we, you would see in the near detector, let's say, and then the green, red, blue, and uh, uh, light blue are for different parameters. The blue one is if actually uh, Theta one three had been zero, and we noticed last time that this isn't, we wouldn't have seen anything, but that would have been bad luck. But it is large enough. And then you see for different, this is for different delta CP, how this changes. And what we do is we just fit the spectra at the far detector for these parameters. And uh, that is first theta one three, the one I just talked about. It's theta two three, uh, the other mixing angle, uh, the matter effects, which are uh, uh, parameterized by this factor that depend on the length, of course, how long you go through a matter, along the distances, and also the electron density, and then the phase delta. We have to get that all out of the same data set, so you have to resolve degeneracies, for example, between the mass ordering and CP. The way you do this is by by looking at the different energy dependence of these effects. And this shows exactly this thing. So this is always the same thing. This is a new E appearance signal, but it, the curves show the variations between normal and inverted ordering or between, and this is for different CPs. You see, it's not only a rate effect, it's also shifting the distribution. So in order to fit all that, you have to fit the energy distribution, not only the rate. And that's why the energy reconstruction in the detector is so important. Okay, this is the bottom line. Um, uh, this is how we would be sensitive after seven and 10 years to CP violation and mass ordering shown as a function of the unknown parameter delta here. You see for the mass ordering, this is the uh, sigmas. 
in any scenario, we'll be able to re, uh, get, give you the mass ordering uh, very, very quickly. The effect is large. But delta CP, it depends, of course, on where delta CP is. If delta CP is, uh, is zero, uh, then, or pi, then, of course, uh, you can't uh, discover it, so to speak. So this is why these curves go down here. We call it the McDonald's plot. In the regions where delta CP is maximal and of a wide region of values, we get uh, uh, you know, five sigma and more and after a few years. This is very similar for hypercamulocanda. The plot looks similar, but not quite. Uh, so the difference is here that it's much more difficult for them to use their beam data because of the shorter baseline uh, to, um, uh, to measure uh, the mass ordering or to determine the mass ordering or hierarchy. So what Hyper-K can do, they, they can either use external data, somebody else uh, finds the mass hierarchy and, and determines it, or they can use atmospheric neutrinos, which uh, reach them through the earth to constrain it. But it, you see that for, uh, uh, depending on where you are in the parameter space, this is actually a um, uh, major uh, effect. So if the mass ordering is given to uh, Hyper-K externally, they are, going to get CP violation very quickly, uh, uh, but it's a kind of a little bit of a different uh, game. In terms of time dependence, how quickly do we get there? This is just years. Both experiments are expected to start at the end of this decade and very quickly will accumulate statistics. Uh, so, but it will still take, you know, yeah, uh, five or six years perhaps uh, to uh, you know, to get uh, statistically significant uh, sample, depending on how quickly you can ramp up. It's very hard to compare these kind of plots, by the way, because the assumptions made are very, very different. This just gives you a qualitative interpretation. Um, so the last five minutes I will use to show something else because. You know, sometimes people think, are these experiments one trick ponies? Is it all about delta CP? No, it's not. There are a lot of other physics uh, uh, these experiments can do. And I show you something that I've talked about in the first lecture, which is a supernova neutrinos. So this is supernova 1987A, uh, uh, which, well, I still remember. I'm not sure how many people here remember, uh, which actually had a major impact on neutrino physics. Uh, and, and this shows the signal recorded by all the experiments that were online uh, in at the time. Uh, uh, it's in total, I think it's 23 events, and it shows the time evolution of this uh, uh, pulse. It takes about 10 seconds um, to, um, takes a 10 seconds about for the neutrinos to, to be emitted. So this is the length of this pulse. pulse. Uh, the neutrinos are observed before the photons, which is an interesting thing. So in, in, in Dune, just remember that beam neutrinos are GeV. Those neutrinos are about 10 MeV, and that shows the signal in charge for uh, 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 this uh, neutral current event on the left and a charged current event on the right. And the scale is centimeters. So while these other tracks are you know, uh, much longer, uh, say 50 centimeters or so, these are very short tracks, which extend, you know, keep in mind the wire spacing in Dune is of the order five millimeter. So uh, something which is one centimeter long only extends over one or two wires. Um, there's another bit of information which we have, I've talked about this. Here important is really the light which is being produced and that helps further to, to, to reconstruct these, uh, these events. What you can do is, is relevant to both for astrophysics and neutrino physics. On the left, you see how that time pulse, uh, the neutrino pulse develops as a function of time. There are these different, uh, um, phases of the supernova with uh, neutronization, accretion, and cooling. At the beginning, the peak is predominantly in mu e, 
as we have seen before. And that's what we are sensitive to. And then it becomes more democratic. And you know, this is just one model. And to see and understand the structure of this is actually very important to understand how this supersonova works. This is what a signal in a, uh, for, a, uh, uh, for a supernova in, our, uh, in, in, in Dune, which is 10 kiloparsec away, would look like. So here you see that initial peak, but you would probably not see it because this initial blue curve actually assumes no oscillations. We know that's not true. So we should really compare the green and the red curve. And the green and the red curve are for normal and inverted ordering. Depending on that, it will actually look quite different. And the statistics of such an event will be enormous. Thousands of neutrinos will be observed in Dune within a, uh, a few seconds. This would be actually from the neutrino physics point quite amazing because you know we wait for five years to measure that thing with a beam, but here we would be able to determine the mass ordering within uh, you know, 0 .01, 0 0.05 seconds. We still have to reconstruct the data, but instantly almost. Um, so that brings me to the end, right on time. Um, thanks you, thank you for listening. I've only been able to cover a small amount of the rich neutrino physics program at accelerators. These next generation experiments will test the three flavor paradigm. Uh, you know, they provide precision measurements of the neutrino sector PMNS matrix. Uh, uh, specifically uh, and uh, search for non-standard physics. And I've not talked about this. Uh, sterile neutrinos, are there extra neutrino states? Uh, uh, is the matrix three by three, perhaps four by four? Uh, dark matter can be searched for and uh, many other exotic physics, uh, both in the far and in the near detector. And, uh, uh, and Albert, of course, is working on a lot of this. Uh, this is complemented by an exciting non-accelerator physics program studying, well, definitely supernova neutrinos. I talked about this, atmospheric neutrinos. Solar neutrinos are a bit of a, a difficult thing. We're working on this right now because solar neutrinos, as we've seen in the first lecture, are relatively low in energy. And anything below like 8 MeV or so, 5 MeV, will be really hard for, for uh, Dune uh, to reconstruct. And we also run into background problems, but I'm optimistic something can be done. If you, I hope you enjoyed the lectures. If you have any questions, please contact me here uh, at this email address. All right, Stefan. Thanks a lot for this uh, very nice and interesting lectures. Uh, I certainly enjoyed them, even though <laughs> direct colleague of yours. Um, yeah, so. Uh, this is this your moment for the questions, uh, whatever you always wanted to ask for neutrinos, but never dared so far, uh, because this is the last lecture. So I invite for questions to Stefan uh, on, on the neutrinos on this lecture, but also if you have some questions with previous lectures. Any questions? Everybody's tired. Oh, it's not quite weekend yet. So l let me warm up with a question. Um, you know, this liquid argon technology is magnificent, seen from from the outside. But but there are challenges, obviously. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, in certainly in the detectors of the size we plan to build for Dune, this has never been done before. So that that's a precedent doing that. So the size is one in the technology. The other is the usage of the data. It's, it's kind of like a, uh, if, if you want a digital bubble chamber at the end, because you have for instance, both calorimeter tracking things in one. And you showed some nice pictures from Microbune, which, you know, this technology is being used in detectors right now. Maybe you could say a little bit if, if this is like exactly the same technology, what we are going to use for, for, for Dune. And uh, how successful is one in, 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 in reconstructing these events? Uh, do, do we get uh, what, what, what we would like to, to achieve in like resolutions or things like that? So just a general you know, thing. So or, think... or are there still challenges left for, for young people to work on reconstruction in liquid argon, for example? The exciting thing about liquid argon is 
so as you point out, it's a little more like a, a bubble chamber. So while overall the data is sparse, you know, it's not as uh, busy as an LHC event, around the interaction is actually a lot of information. And that's a challenge. It's, you know, it, at the end, the challenge is very uh, similar to any kind of image reconstruction. Uh, you know, uh, when you have to identify a cat or a dog picture on the internet. And that actually um, is very exciting. And I think for the people who come into the field to, to develop uh, that even further, because you can use you know, a lot of uh, deep learning AI technology to uh, to do this reconstruction. You know, the original way a particle physicist would reconstruct an uh, event uh, uh, like um, like this. I, I lost the slides. Um, is is to just you know try to stitch hits together, but it turns out that it is actually much better. And we have published papers on this. This was a simple one, you know, these are actually simpler, but if you look at more complicated pictures like this with showers and tracks. You're actually not sharing in case you are. Uh, oh, I'm this. sorry. Uh, um, I thought I'm sharing. Um, yeah, if you look something like this, you know, the tracks here, you can probably stitch the hits together, but to really understand the showers and the, you use these image reconstruction algorithms like convolutional neural networks, we have published stuff on that. And that's where we really need a lot of work. The other challenge is then, of course, to not only do this for one event, but then to write algorithms which are efficient enough to do this on large data sets and, you know, not use all of the grid. Uh, uh, so that's that's the next challenge there's a lot of things to do here which are state of the art right and i can confirm for example for those people interested that particularly in the CERN neutrino group we are very much focusing on this reconstruction using machine learning techniques so uh, it's at the cutting edge of of, of uh, doing this these things um, I see there is a question from uh, Sohan, and, and either you can ask it directly or I can read it to Stefan. Uh, when the near detected, would they not be correct to its respective lepton? No. So, uh, so, and so the thing is that, well, the neutrinos, uh, you know, the curse and the, and the uh, blessing is that they don't do very much. So the interaction cross section is incredibly small. So only uh, even though there are lots of neutrinos interacting, it's still in, in the near detector. It's a tiny fraction of the neutrinos being produced, and it's got to be because you actually send the neutrino beam through uh, a thousand kilometers of Earth, and most of them don't do anything. They reach still the detector. So that's why the flux has to be so intense. So yes, some of the neutrinos will interact in the near detector, but you know, still uh, the vast, vast majority will just go. So we are not looking at the same neutrino. We just characterize the neutrino beam by picking a few out of them. There's definitely not a tunnel going, by the way, from, from Fermilab to South Dakota, even though sometimes when you have the press there, they ask for the tunnel. Uh, it's not like uh, uh, electron or proton accelerator. The neutrinos just go through the Earth. Right, thanks. Yeah, if, so, in fact, I, yeah go ahead, sorry. I'll, go, go, if, no, no, finish, please. No problem. No, I was just saying about the next question. So if you wanted to say something about it. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to add uh, an interesting factoid for those people who work at the uh, LHC and you know, one of the problems we have at the LHG is pileup, that within a, a certain proton-proton bunch crossing, you actually have multiple events happening because the high intensity of the beams in the LHC. Something similar, actually, despite the fact that these neutrinos are so weakly interacting, is, is something similar we start to see also in neutrino physics with these very intense beams that Stefan is talking about. So the near detector, will actually suffer what what we call uh, this liquid argon near detector will suffer from pileup that within a shot of neutrinos coming there because they come in bunches uh, in fact you will have multiple neutrinos interacting 
but still it's such a tiny fraction of the total that that you know it's only to monitor the, the shape of that but pile up actually is becoming an issue also for neutrino physics in near detectors all right um, i'll leave you to check the next question so yeah, uh, so yes hyper k as, uh, as i i showed you the um the plot at the end so hyper k sensitivity to mass ordering or mass hierarchy which is the same thing is uh much smaller from the uh from the neutrino beam because it is only going through uh 295 kilometers and uh, you know the effect is small and uh, it's it's difficult for them to you know resolve any degeneracy so they have to get the data from somewhere else either some other experiment or what they can do is they can use their atmospheric neutrino signals so hyper k will see atmospheric neutrinos and um, and of course as we've seen last time the atmospheric neutrinos go through the earth either you know they come from the bottom or the top they can come from anywhere so uh, when you have some directionality in your measurement, you can actually determine where they come from. And uh, uh, so you can use this to, that ha can help you to disentangle the mass ordering. But, uh, you know, that's one of the advantages of Dune that it can do the mass ordering just with the beam data and on a very quick time scale. All right, thank you. Out there. Any further questions, you can also raise your hand and, and speak after that. Uh, or you can still continue in the chat. I'm going to wait a moment if there are additional questions to Stefan. I don't see any. Uh, further questions. So then we will conclude this lecture series. The uh, slides of the talks will be, they are not quite there yet, but they will be uploaded on the uh, web page and as well as the videos once they have been screened and seen that they, they came out correctly. And at this place, I thank everybody for joining us here and I thank really uh, big thanks to Stefan for this uh, nice effort uh, he did of giving us very clear lectures over the last three days so thank you Stefan thanks, thanks Albert everybody. for inviting me all right thanks everybody and, bye uh, yeah bye this is the end of the lectures